Hello weaving friends, partners in crime. I'm starting a new project today and it might be really, really fun and one of the best projects I've ever made or I might regret it for the rest of my life. But here's the deal. You're gonna come along with me and you're gonna help me to keep accountable so that I get this project finished. Interested? I know you are. Remember this little guy? from several videos ago. Actually, I've done two videos with this tiny toy loom, and this is going to be my instrument of torture. I mean, my equipment of choice. Here's the idea. This has a very narrow weaving width, okay? And I also don't know how long a warp I can get onto this loom, because I've all only done short warps before. So that's going to be a bit of an experiment. But the idea is to make a lap blanket by weaving long strips on this little loom and then seaming the strips together to make the lap blanket afterwards. Why would I want to do this when I have really big looms all around me and I don't need to make tiny strips and sew them together? Well, it's not all about me, is it? It's about encouraging people to have a go at weaving. People who are not in the position to buy a larger loom or a fancier loom, these looms are quite affordable. And you can weave plain weave on them and you can weave narrow strips on them. So let's work with that. Let's see what we can do with that. I've got some lovely thick yarn here um, this is a 10 ply from Bendigo Woolen Mills, which is equivalent of an RN weight. This one is in coastal blue. Love this color. And this one is in the shadow color. And I'm going to do some sort of configuration like I'm going to warp with one of these and weave with the other or whatever. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. I mean, I've got a ton of strips to do, so I've got plenty of time to decide exactly how I'm going to go about this. Here's the setup. I've got a warping board at one end of the table because I didn't want to take the warp all to the other end of the table. It's just too long. So I've got my warping board here so that my pegs start here because I'm going to direct warp the loom. At the other end of the table, I've got my little teensy loom and I have clamped my warping board to the table at that end and I'm going to clamp this little loom to the table at this end with a spring clamp and I wish I had more spring clamps and I need to buy some more and I'm going to do that when I remember. So clamping that, it would be more ideal if I had two spring clamps for this for the loom and two spring clamps for the warping board but we do what we can. You'll also notice that I have mess everywhere, there's stuff all around me I mean uh, beautiful creative projects in progress. Usually I do like to tidy things up before I start a brand new video or tutorial or whatever. And today I was just like, well, I think most of you understand and you would probably rather see the video rather than have to wait for it. So we're just gonna go with it. One thing I'm not gonna do for this project is overthink it too much. So I'm not, doing a whole bunch of calculations. I'm just gonna wing a little bit of it, but I guess like an educated version of winging it. Um, and I'm just gonna make a start. So you can see this yarn is quite thick, but I am actually gonna double it up in this. This is like, these heddles here are about five dent. And um, so that's quite a lot of space. It's quite a, an open set. So even with my thick yarn, I'm going to double it up and I'm going to start by tying onto my open rod. Now something I really need to make sure of this time, the mistake that I made last time, can't believe I did this but I did, is um, I warped underneath this beam here for some of them, like half of the warp threads I went over and the other half I went under. No idea why, don't know what I was thinking. 
but I definitely need to not do that again. So I'm going to make sure that it goes over and then I'll take that through the first slot because the first heddle here, well, it's actually the second heddle, isn't it? It's the back heddle because I'm at the back of the loom here. So that one has a slot. And then if you see the other heddle, the front heddle has a hole first. So for the sake of the, for clarity, um, I won't put this back down so you can see what I'm doing just for now. I'm going through the slot first on the back. Mm -hmm. And then I'll just hold that so it doesn't slink back through. Then I'm gonna go through the hole in the front heddle. And I'm taking the loop through and that doubles the yarn. If I didn't want to double the yarn, I'd just go through the slots first and um, thread up the holes afterwards. Okay, and then at the very front, we're gonna to have to change angles. At the very front, we have the beta, which has slots in it. And so that loop, that very first loop, is also gonna to have to go through the first slot here. Take that through and over the front beam. Now we're going to head up to the warping board and I'm going to pop that loop over the first peg. Doesn't, doesn't matter which peg I go to, I'm going to use both of these. I'll put half of it on this peg and half on this peg. Now we've, we're at the back of the loom again. This is the apron rod and so I'm going to go underneath that apron rod but make sure that I bring the loop up over this beam rather than going through. I think that's what, what I did last time. Uh, I wasn't thinking about it. Where we're at now is on the back heddle, we are in a slot with the first loop and then it's got a hole right next to it. So we wanna do the hole. Uh, I'm gonna need to see what I'm doing. Okay, so the hole next to the slot and then I'll move that up again and that one's going to go in the slot that is next to the hole on the front heddle. Threading for plain weave and then we have our little beta and we can pop that through the next slot on the beta. So basically we're not going to have any holes or any slots free. They're all going to be threaded. So I'll bring that loop out feeding it off the ball and I'll pop it over the peg and not being all tight on this peg, I'm giving it plenty of slack so that I can get it off easily afterwards. All right, let's see that one last time and then I think you're gonna be okay to continue on because we're just repeating right across until all the holes and slots are filled. Okay, so on the back heddle, let's have a look at that. Um, we have a slot and a hole threaded and the next space is a slot. And we're gonna go in there with the loop and then I'll just hold it there for a sec and I'll change this heddle so that you can see what I'm doing next. So on the front heddle, I have a hole next. So I've got one hole threaded, I've got one slot threaded and now I'm doing the next hole. Then we have our red beta and I'm going to grab that loop and go in the very next available slot there. Bring that through and over the front bar and then we'll gently pull that out and take it to the peg. A double-ended threading hook is gonna be a really good asset for this part of the threading and warping because you can get right into those holes with the thin end and you can also follow it through on the back heddle through into the slot. The thin, um, thin end is okay for doing that too. And then when you come to the beta, you just swap the end and it's so easy to just pull that through really fast and all you have to do is swap it over.
This toy loom is available on Amazon, that's where I got mine and I'm going to leave a link down below in case you want to check it out. It really is a, a very affordable loom. Yes, it does have its downsides and please do watch my other two other videos that will help you to get a handle on whether this loom would be a good choice for you or not. But for the price, it's a really fun piece of equipment. Let's finish off by tying off onto the apron rod. 
a little bit finicky. There's not a lot of space between the apron rod and that bar, but that's okay. We can do it. All right, and then I'm going to start winding my warp on. Okay, there are various ways to do this. I'm going to make it a little bit easier on myself. I'm just going to pull the warp off the pegs. And uh, for tensioning, I'm just going to hold it up here near the loom. And then I've got some paper ready, some brown paper. You know I like to use my brown paper rolls. And I'm just going to start rolling on. So I'm going to aim for some good tension. Um, but this loom is not, <laughs> not brilliant with tension, but we'll see how we go. Um, okay. So I'm going to do probably roll on a full rotation and then I'll just pop the brake on and then I'll see about getting my paper inserted in there. So I can take the brake off and just roll that in a little bit manually first. Get it rolled in far enough that it's not going to fall out. Pop the brake on. Yeah, it's still a little loose, so I will keep going. Put the brake on now. I'm just going to give my warp a nice yank at the front. Make sure that it's tensioning up against that paper. Okay, there we go again. Now I'm going to put my brake on and just see how my paper's going. Just need to tighten that up a little bit and brake off again. Nothing goes anywhere, so you can just take the brake off as long as you're hold, putting some tension on the warp. It'll feed through okay. Something that's not feeding so well is my paper. I did actually fold my paper in half. You never be believe the reason I folded my paper in half. Do I even tell you? I will tell you because you're a grown up and you understand. Because I have favorite pieces of paper and I didn't want to cut it in half. I want to be able to fold it out and use it for another project on a larger loom. You know, surely, yeah. We all have favorite pieces of paper, don't we? Anyway, I folded it. That wasn't the best idea because it is now a little bit looser on one part than it is on the other, but we will press on. It just means that I have to stop um, a little more often perhaps and reposition the paper a little bit. Yeah, it'll be all right. It'll be fine. All right, off we go again. Now, I think I pointed out at the start that I don't know how long a warp these looms can take. And so this is a little bit experimental. This warp is, hmm, what did it end up being? 80 inches? I think I'll have to check that I'll put it up on the screen here I'm pretty sure I measured out 80 in inches but I did say I was winging it a bit didn't I not fussing around too much with calculations and so on you know sometimes it's just nice to do that and sometimes it just doesn't feel necessary to have everything calculated just so Sort this paper out. Yeah, it's going all right. This um, length of warp seems fine on here so far. We will see what it's like in the weaving, but it doesn't seem too bulky for it yet. And it's a fairly thick yarn too, so it's good. It's positive. Break on, paper position, tug, and tugging at the front as well. Okay. 
almost have run out of paper. Just pop my brake on and tug. Also do a little bit of finger combing out the front here just so I don't get any of those annoying loose warp threads. Sometimes you get just one or two that are a little bit loose and all you needed to do was just a little bit of finger combing. All right, now I'm contemplating my next piece of paper. Uh, I'm not too far off finishing, having enough warp rolled on, but I would like to separate that warp further. So I might even have to cut one of my favorite pieces of paper. Hang on. Hang on. How about this one? Hey, that's almost perfect. It's not quite as thick, but I'm feeling okay about that because I've got that nice thick double folded piece in there that I will be using again because I didn't cut it. All right, so position the paper in. So I really don't need much more paper because my warp's nearly there. All right, how are we going there? I don't want to tug too hard because I'll tug it right out. It's quite smooth, that paper. And just a little bit of a finger comb and a fiddle at the front. All going well. I'm pleased that this loom is staying put with just the one single clamp. I was a little bit concerned that it was going to go traveling. But that shows you how strong these clamps are. All right. Anything that I use in this tutorial, like the clamp, like the double-ended threading hook, like the loom, anything will be linked down below so that you can see it. And that just makes it easy because I get a lot of questions. Where did you get this? Where did you get that? It's so much easier if I can just link it down below and anyone who's interested can have a look. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'm still getting over a bad cold. So if I sound a little bit croaky, that's why. Okay, so I have run out of paper again, but I'm all right with that. I'm not going to put more paper just for this last little bit. All right, so break on. Mm -hmm. That's a nice looking warp. Very nice. Okay, now just cut the loops at the front. You can either grab each loop and cut through it that way, or if you want to, you can grab a whole bunch and trim it like that. Um, your, your decision will just end up probably being how easy it is to cut your loops. Well, I did let my loops go too. I didn't do any choke ties. Um, and also, you know, there's just a teensy bit um, less waste if you cut the loops through like that. But either way is good. Um, if your loops are uneven, as mine are a little bit, you'll notice some are a little bit longer than others, then you may want to trim them anyway once you get them cut because it's easier to cut, because um, it's easier to tie on and everything with yarn that's even, it's much easier. Uh, the difference in length is just because I, I had it traveling to different pegs and there was a, a little bit of distance between those pegs and that just impacts on how far the yarn has to travel to go around any given peg. Oh, I think I've got all my loops. Oh, hello. It's always a stray one. Yeah, so I have quite, quite different lengths, so I'm just going to trim them off so that they're all similar. And um, that'll be easier. It's only a little bit of waste. Okay. All right, so now we are ready to tie on. 
I want to turn the loom around to face me for this next bit so I can take that spring clamp off there, swing the loom around and then just to help keep it steady I can pop the spring clamp on the side again like that and then look at that it's so good. Now we want to have the warp coming over this front beam again and we'll be tying it onto the apron rod at the bottom here. So I'm just going to take little bunches of yarn. Oh, another thing you can do at this point is just check that your threading is correct by pulling the warp out and then changing your sheds and making sure that you get two distinct sheds. Now, when I say two distinct sheds, you can see there are two bits of yarn in each um, slot here and that the whole threads are down. So sometimes you will have just one piece of yarn in each slot, sometimes you'll have two, sometimes you'll have more. So remember that I double warped at the beginning. So I took the loop through every hole, every slot, and that's why I have two threads. Okay, so um, that's one of my sheds and there is the other. Yes, they are a little bit sticky at the moment, but I am using wool and that will improve. It'll be fine. We have tricks to use against sticky wool too, don't we? Okay, so a little bunch at a time and I'm separating that out. Actually, I will get another bunch of two just for the sake of symmetry and for neatness of tying on. And then I'm going to pop around the apron rod. I'm going to do surgeon's knots. So bring a tail up on either side, tie over once, but don't tighten it down and then tie over again on one side and then tighten it down. Next bunch. It's a good opportunity to get your yarn out nice and straight. That's also going to help with your tension. Again, there's not a heap of room for your fingers in between the apron rod and the front cloth beam here. To counteract that, you could take the cloth uh, the apron rod back a little bit like that and that would give you a little bit more room but then you have kind of less room underneath so either way you don't have a lot of room but it's still doable uh, the surgeon's knot again over twice and then tighten and then i'll just pop to the other side and grab the same size bunch and just keep going. There's a lot of repetition in weaving, whatever type of weaving you do. And so it, it gives you such a great opportunity to practice things over and over again, just because there are a lot of them to do, like these bunches. We're just doing the same thing over and over. All right, getting there. Oh dear, my light, my light is going in and out. It's that time of day in the studio, it's late afternoon. So I've got sun coming in the window, too strong, and then it goes behind a cloud and then it's too dark. Ugh. Problems, problems of um, taking film, hey? Okay, so you can see I'm kind of reaching in different places so that I don't get too many fumbly fingers in one place at once. Uh, in the last bunch, I don't have four slots worth, I've got three. So then I will just break them up and that'll be fine. One thing I do wanna do on this particular loom is I want to tie the warp on the inside of the of the ties at the bottom 
so that I don't have warp slipping off the edges. Hope that makes sense. I might show you on this side. So there's a tie on each side of the apron rod right here and it's in a, a kind of a slit and on the other side as well. Now I can tie my warp to the outer edge of that apron rod after the slot, uh, after the slit and the tie, but then I risk it slipping off the edge. Um, that's just for this particular loom, the way it is set up. And so even though it's a little bit of a squash, I'm just going to move some of that over and I'm going to tie on the inside of that tie so that it's not here and then potentially, I don't know, getting stuck, slipping off. I just like it to be secure. Don't have to worry about it then. All right, now we want to tighten all of those up. Now, whether you go ahead and do a second knot is up to you. I usually see how my warp feels. Now, if I feel that these middle ones that I tied first are still pretty firm after I've gone and tied all of these ones, then it's probably not going to slip, but it does depend on the yarn. If you have a slippery wool, if you have any silk in your wool, if you're using a different type of fiber, then yeah, you might have slipping and that's easy to fix by just doing an additional overhand knot on top of these knots. So I would just do it like that. But I'm feeling like I don't need to. Um, and the reason that I wouldn't is because it does create extra bulk. But um, this is actually really nice, really good tension. It means I'm ready to start weaving. Yay. I just need a stick shuttle and need to load that up and then I can start. This little loom did come, well, they come with, I think, three different shuttles. It actually comes with yarn as well, um, just some acrylic yarn to get you started. And it comes pre-warped. But you can see that all in my other videos uh, and what my thoughts on that are. Uh, I'm using an Ashford stick shuttle and it's um, a good width for this loom. Just because the ones that come with the loom, they're okay, they're not great. So if you have something better, you're probably going to want to end up using that. So I'm just winding off. This is probably going to weave up pretty fast because of the thickness of the yarn. And that'll be kind of a treat for me because I use a lot of really thin yarns because I like them, but obviously they take longer to weave. All right, so it's just enough to get us started here. Now I've got a choice. I can either put in some warp separators or I can just start weaving. And I think I'm going to just start weaving. And there's that sun again. So I'm gonna open one shed and take the shuttle through. I'm gonna leave a little tail so that I can tuck that in. At this stage, I've still got the loom um, clamped to the table because I'm just going to stand here and and weave to begin with but you certainly don't have to do that okay and so now I'm going to just take my tail and tuck it in a few warp threads deep tuck it in and fix up the edge now the edges are something I'm going to want to pay attention to here because two reasons I don't want too much draw in because that's going to make my warp just skinnier and skinnier. And I also want consistent edges because I'm going to be joining the panels and the edges are going to be on show. Like it'll be important because I'm planning on doing a mattress stitch to join them. And so I want them to look nice. So how am I going to maintain the edges? Let's have a think about it. We are going to 
use my pinching technique. If you haven't seen that before, you need to. And I've got a video on it on YouTube, on my channel that you can access for free. I am going to make sure that I leave a bit of a weft angle. And we're gonna, um, we'll try and have a look at this from overhead afterwards so that you can see a little bit more of how it looks from my view where I'm standing. So I'm just changing between the sheds and I'm doing a plain weave. It's looking good already. It is gonna weave up fairly fast, but the amount of panels that I'm gonna need, that's why I said at the start that I may live to regret this. But I like it so far, it's nice. Uh, so we were talking about edges. So I'm gonna make sure that I don't put too much tension on my weft. So in addition to the angle, the slight angle, see I'm not yanking it in, I'm not trying to pull it right in at the edge, I'm just letting it nestle at the warp edge. And if you let it nestle, then it's not gonna do anything really drastic. My, um, my loom's a little squeaky. I think that happens when you put the tension on. It starts to squeak a little bit. It's not a problem. Very easy to use, really, this loom. Just up and down, changing the shed manually. The beta is really quite nice to use. It's very gentle. Um, and it allows you to get a nice straight beat as well. I'd be interested to see how I would go kind of trying to relax and weaving on this loom. Like I'm wondering if I can do it as a lap loom kind of thing, because I, I like to relax in the evenings. Um, I make a point of relaxing in the evenings, but um, I usually like to be doing something with my hands as well. So I'm not sure. I might take this inside tonight and try it out as a lap loom and let you know what I think, whether it's a good thing or not. Um, well, these colors work well. So for another warp, for another of my panels, and I should be able to get two panels out of this for the length. The length of the warp will be the width, or half of the length of the warp will be the width of the blanket, if that makes sense, without doing all the calculations and showing all that with you. But basically, this is going to sit horizontally um, rather than vertically. So horizontal panels, stacked. Um, <clears throat> now, where am I? Yep, okay. Yeah, um, so yes, for my next panel, I might warp with the coastal blue and then weave with this one. And then for another panel, I might warp with coastal blue and weave with coastal blue or warp with shadow and weave with shadow. I'm just not sure yet. I've certainly got plenty of time to figure it out, haven't I? Because I'm gonna be here for the rest of my life. No, not really. I'm gonna be here for a while to get enough panels to do the blanket. Okay. Um, and you might have noticed just then I just changed the way I was doing it. So I was, um, beading on an open shed before, but another thing that you can do is open the new shed and then the weft from the last shed is kind of clamped in there and then you can beat. That can um, be a good way to get a really nice even beat, depending, depending on what you wanna do. And then the new shed is already open. Or you can beat on an open shed. You can do what suits you. But um, I thought I'd just explain that because I completely changed the way that I was doing it. And you can also decide whether you would like to use a single weft. You notice that I'm using a single weft and not a doubled. I used a doubled warp, but that doesn't mean I have to use a doubled weft. For a fully balanced weave, I would. But I'm not concerned about a balanced weave. I'm concerned about 
getting enough coverage and about having the fabric feel nice. And I often find that whatever I'm weaving, a single weft is more pleasing to me. It gives just a, a slightly softer, lighter hand to the fabric. And that's my preference, but also, yeah, you can double the weft for a thicker fabric if you want to. Okay, here's a slight overhead shot. It's not the best angle, I'm sorry about that. It's about the best I could do for now though, uh, with the equipment that I have. So I'm changing the shed and then beating. And then my shed's already changed for the next shed. So here's that pinching and the angle. It's a soft angle. You see I let the yarn kind of drape rather than pulling it. Change the shed and beat. And as I said, you don't have to change the shed. You can beat on an open shed. I'll show you what that looks like. So this is my next shed here. I'm going to leave that open and beat. And then I'm going to change to the next shed. So that's beating on an open shed. You could try both and see what suits you. I just kind of like the way it feels with this loom beating on a closed shed. Even if it's just for the fact that it's oddly satisfying. <laughs> it just feels good. Okay, so um, you're also going to have some control over your beat because this is a more open set on this loom. You can't change that, but you can control your beat. So I feel like my beat, it's getting a little bit closer as I work my way up. So I want to pay a little bit more attention to that because I don't want it, I don't want it gappy, but I don't want it really closely beat so that it becomes weft faced. I still want it to be a, an open, open enough weave. So for me, I'm going to weave this in one long gigantic panel and then I'm going to cut them apart and seam them that way. Um, you could, if you wanted to go with like a, a low or no sew option, you could weave the length of each panel if you've got them on the same warp. So say you've got two panels on one warp, you could weave the length of each one and hem stitch in between them. Now the only thing with that is you would need to be really careful with measuring your panels to make sure that they're the same length as you're weaving them. And that can be a little bit difficult to be honest, especially when you're using something like wool that is elastic. You, it can be quite challenging to weave just the same length. So, you know, in one regard, it's, it's a good way to do it because you can take your panels off the loom and you've got your two separate panels ready to seam together. But on the other hand, if those panels are not the exact same length, then your blanket's going to look weird, if you get me. So for me, I, I don't trust that I can really successfully weave my panels the exact same length. And so I'm choosing to cut them apart and then I can choose the length I want and then I can seam them um, so that even if they are slightly different in length, the seaming can take care of them because I can decide. I can cut off extra if I need to or whatever. But I have the luxury of a sewing machine and not everybody does. So that is going to play a part in what you might decide to do if you were going to do a blanket. Now, this is a, it's a funny kind of tutorial because it's, Kind of, like I said, it's kind of winging it. Um, oops, didn't close, didn't change my shed. Um, kind of winging it without doing too many measurements and so on. But I am showing you the process along the way. 
So it's kind of like a, a thing to get you started um, and give you some ideas for what you might do if you either have one of these looms or you want to get one. It's not so much to go, here is a complete finished project and this is exactly how you do it. If you want more of that kind of class, uh, that kind of information, then getting my patterns or my online classes is a better option because they are really highly detailed. Um, having said that, I don't have a class with this loom. All right, so I'm getting up pretty close to my beta, which means I want to advance my warp. And so to do that, I'm just going to hold on to the apron rod to make sure it doesn't go pinging anywhere. And then I want to, oh, actually, before I do that, I want to loosen off the brake at the back. Otherwise, my warp's not going anywhere. And I just want to let off a little bit at a time and then pop the brake back on. And then I can take the brake off at the front and take up that slack. Put my brake back on and then I'm ready to start weaving again. You don't want to pull it too far forward because you've got this cloth beam here and you've got the arms of the beater here. And as you bring them forward, um, everything just gets a little bit close and you don't want those touching because they will stop each other working properly. So just don't bring your warp forward too far and you'll be fine. It's always better to just kind of, you know, inch your warp forward slowly anyway, because it gives you extra leeway to tighten it up or whatever. Um, makes sure that your weaving doesn't look too different in between where you've advanced your warp. So you're keeping a similar tension. Now, having said that, my warp needs a little more tension. I'm going to actually tension it from the back because it's a bit close at the front to be pulling forward even more. So one of the limitations of this loom is because of the brake system, you can't always get really um, refined tension. It's got these big cogs and you have to make the piece of wood stick into one of the cogs. And that doesn't always allow for, you know, maybe just going a little bit more with the tension. It's like, well, you either have to go less because it's going to be too tight or you have to go um, a little bit more and try to make that work. It's just one of the particulars of this kind of loom because it's a toy loom. It is made to function, but at the same time, it's not one of your high functioning looms like um, a rigid heddle loom or a table loom or, or any of those big, more official looms. So as long as, you know, if you buy one of these looms that you're not expecting it to do what a rigid heddle loom can do, for example, like it's never going to hold the same amount of tension as one, for example. And there are other differences. Obviously, it only comes in one width, so that's quite narrow. Now, is this five, five inch weaving width? Let me measure that for you. I'm pretty sure it's about five inches. Oh, okay, it's a little bit more. So my weaving at the moment is almost six inches. So if I measure the actual beta from slot to slot, it's exactly six inches. That's the weaving width I have. And then you get that natural amount of draw in as you weave. Yes, I was saying that you've got to be careful about your draw in and make sure that you can minimize it. But there's always going to be some sort of draw in. It's just the nature of weaving. And it's completely normal and you allow for that. All right, friends, I think I'm going to have to leave it here for today and continue weaving on another day because it's actually my turn to make dinner tonight. And I've got to go and start on that. Can't have people starving now, can we? Usually my husband makes dinner, but he's had a really big day. And so I said I would do it for him. But that means that we need to stop. Sometimes that is a good thing because I've warped and woven today. And sometimes it's, a, it's good to have a break in between. And as I said, maybe I will 
grab this and um, try and test it out while I'm relaxing tonight. I'll take it inside with me and see how we go. Then I can report back to you.
It's several days later and I have finished this warp. It went really well. I'm surprised at how much I can actually roll onto this front cloth beam, especially considering this is really quite thick wool and it was a long warp. So that was a good test of the loom for me. Also something that really pleased me through work in working through this warp was the tension. I was actually able to achieve a much better tension than I had previously. Now, I don't know if it's just the wool, that the wool is, you know, it has that nice amount of elasticity that doesn't overstretch, but allows you to get that little bit more tension. Um, or if I'm just getting more used to using the loom. The tension was really good. I was very pleased. I did have to fiddle a bit, but that's okay. I was happy with it. So I'm ready to cut the warp from the loom, but I also wanted to confirm for you that it can be used as a lap loom. I have done that. That's how I got through this warp, by just weaving on it in the evenings. It's not as easy to use on your lap as say a rigid heddle loom because of the height, it's a taller loom. Um, and the rigid heddle, the way it's set up is flatter. It's easier to see what you're doing. It's easier to prop on your lap. Um, so the, the height of this one makes it a little bit trickier to weave on, on your lap, but still completely doable. All right, ready to cut this. And then we can roll it off and see how it looks. Okay, here we go. I'm just cutting from the back. I've already loosened off the tension at the front, so that's no problem. Making sure that I cut my weft yarn off as well. And then I can just take off the front break right here. It's very easy to use these brakes on and off. And I'll just gently bring that through. Okay. And roll it off. I don't need fringe, obviously. I'm not using fringe for my blankets. I'm gonna be seaming, so I can just cut straight through that. And here we have our first blanket strip. Remembering that this is two strips because I'm gonna be dividing them in half to get the width of the blanket. So my next job, um, I have to secure these ends, obviously, because they're just raw ends at the moment. I'm gonna use my serger to do that. And then following that, I'm going to re-warp the loom. And this time I'm going to warp it with the darker blue yarn and I'm going to weave with the lighter yarn. That's just gonna give me, like I'm using the same colors, but I'm, I'm swapping it over. It's gonna give me a contrasty look to the blanket in the way of stripes. The raw edges are secured. And now I've just folded this in half. Um, so this is the one long panel and I've just folded it over itself with the fold over here and I just wanted to measure to see what I've come out with. So I've got about 33 and a half inches there for one width of one panel, which is just about perfect, almost exactly what I wanted really. And that is from, I think I told you it was an 80 inch total warp length. It was just slightly more than that, about 83 inches. Okay, so I am, so at this point, I could, if I wanted to wet finish this panel, I'm not gonna cut it in half at this fold until it's wet finished. I don't cut hand woven fabric until it's wet finished because it's liable to spring apart and then um, I can always secure it, but then I, I'm gonna lose a little bit more than if it was wet finished. So the wet finishing is like a, an extra level of security. So I could do that one just on its own now, but I'm gonna wait until I have several panels, wet finish them all together. That makes more sense to me to sort of batch. I like to sort of batch the work that I'm doing into specific tasks. So this one's just gonna set aside and wait for me until I have some more panels to do. Now, if you're thinking is looking a little bit rough at the moment, that is completely normal for fabric straight off the loom. It's going to, once I have it wet finished, it's going to be nice, it's gonna be soft and supple and it's going to bloom so that it looks like a much nicer fabric. At the moment, it's quite stiff. Uh, it's very thick, obviously, 
and yeah it doesn't look as even as it could but that is all going to be worked out in the wet finishing so i'm going to get on to doing my next warp Got a little tip for you well I say a little tip but this can make a really big difference to successfully tensioning this loom I did mention before that sometimes you need to fiddle a little bit between the front tension and the back tension but I want to be a little bit more specific about that right now because it's just happened to me so it's the perfect time for me to explain it okay so my tension is too loose you can see there that that's pretty loose and I want to tighten it up but when I come to the front break, so I tip that up and I bring it forward about as much as I want to tension it. A little bit more than that. And when I try to um, put this front break down again, it's in between the notches. And so if I let it go back and put the break on there, then my tension's still not good enough. But if I try to keep tensioning it, I can't because the notches between the notches that the break goes into are quite big so this is can be a potentially frustrating problem but this is a way around it so when that happens to you just put the break down and even if the tension is not tight enough and then go around to your back break Okay, and take the break off there and then tension it backwards. So going back, back, I need a little more. And then I can put the break on in that notch, turn it back around. You don't need to turn it around, just turning around for the camera. You can actually do this um, with your left hand. And now when I come to the front, I've got great tension. So each time that I want to advance my warp, I do start off at the back break and I let it off one or two notches, depending on how far, like if the weaving's really, really up against the, the beta here, then I'll take it two notches. Um, but if I just want to advance a little bit, I'll just do one notch. And then I come to the front and I tighten it up here Okay, that's the, the normal way to tension the loom. But it's at this point that I'll make a decision. Do I need to go back to the back again and just um, pull back the tension on that? So it's like, it's kind of like a tug of war <laughs> between the front and the back. Say if you're weaving on a rigid heddle loom, 
you can do all of your tensioning by just letting off that little bit from the back break and then um, tensioning it up on the front because it, the tensioning is very fine and more precise and much easier to do. But as I said, this one has larger notches and you're also doing it manually, like you're actually turning this thing with your fingers and it can be tricky because you've got your brake there, but you've got your fingers there too. And you're like trying to tension both at once. And sometimes it is tricky, but I hope that tip helps you. Okay, so I've got my strips of fabric all wet finished and dried and they've plumped up really nicely. They have shrunk a little bit. I've lost a little bit of length and a little bit of width, but that was fully to be expected. So because I, my strips are long, these are going to be halved as was my plan. And so I'm just gonna do that now. Um, I'm using my rotary cutter and my self-healing mat but of course, a pair of scissors would more than suffice. So to measure them, some of these strips are slightly different in their length, but I'm gonna work that all out once I get the strips together. What I wanna do right now is just to cut them apart. So to measure that out, I'm just folding it in half. I'll use the, um, my ruler here as a marker, and then I can just open one of these out and I know that that there is going to be my cutting mark because that was my fold. So now I'm just going to cut that. It's a thicker fabric, so the rotary cutter struggles a little bit more, but still does a great job. Now, as soon as I have cut all of these strips, I'm going to take them to my serger and secure these raw ends. They're okay for now, but I wouldn't want to leave them for a long time. It's a thicker yarn. It's a thicker fabric and so more likely to spring apart. And now I'm just going to do the same with every single strip. Fold it in half and then I'll take them and secure them. I need my fold at this end so I can cut. So I'm getting much closer to finishing this project, which is great. And it's been a lot of fun and a really good challenge to see what I could do on the toy loom. So all of those ends are secured by being surged now. The next thing that I want to do is just to lay out the panels because I haven't been able to do this properly yet because the panels haven't been cut in half as they needed to be. So I just want to make a little bit of space here and lay the panels out just to see how the arrangement is going to look. I also need to come back and um, cut all of these little tails off but that's okay I can do that anytime so I'm going to use a mattress stitch in between these two and then um, at the edges the vertical edges of the blanket I'm planning to do like a more traditional hem I'll have to see how that goes because it is a thicker fabric um, I'll see how my machine likes that idea Whoops, wrong one. I need a, I want to alternate between the dark and the light panels. Now I did say that some of the panels are gonna be longer than others. That's okay, I'll work that out in the hemming process. They're all a pretty consistent width, which is great because then all the stripes are gonna look the same. 
Uh oh, I'm running out of room here. Let's see, I'll get one more panel here and then I'll have to push these up. You would think that having a studio to myself, I would have tons of space, but I just seem to fill it up. All right, I'll bring this one up to the top and it can go there. It's just to get a visual check of how things are gonna look. And I also wanted to measure for the dimensions of this lap blanket. Let's see, from the top, so I'm not gonna lose any measurements in the seaming here because it's a mattress stitch. So the mattress stitch, I've got a, a video about it on my channel um, and I'll, I'll try and link to that down below. But basically you are butting the fabric edges up against each other. So there's no real seam allowance. Um, so you don't lose any of the width that way. Let's see. So I'm just over 40 inches in length. And then the average width, I'm gonna to have to average it out because like this panel is quite a bit shorter. So I'm gonna to have to work that out. So the, the shortest panel is 32 inches long. And then like as a comparison, this one is 33 inches long. So that's just differences in the warp, obviously that I wove a little bit more or that I had a little bit more warp on that one, whatever. It doesn't matter because I will work it all out. So my next task, other than cutting off these tails at the back, is to start mattress stitching all of these panels together. So I've ended up with eight panels and they're all gonna be stitched every one so that it joins to the next one. But isn't this exciting? It's getting close to being finished, which is always great. And it's the fabric's lovely and soft. I did give it a little press as well after the wet finishing and the drying and I'll give it another press afterwards to once it's all seamed just to make everything lay flat and look a little bit more professional. Time to join some strips. Now I'm not going to make a whole tutorial out of this part because I've done this before. I've already got a video on here how to do a mattress stitch and you can look that up if you want to find more out find out more about it. But basically what I'm going to show you here is um, a little bit more of my decision making process in case you end up making a blanket for yourself. So I'm just putting them right sides up and I'm going to line them up on one side and not worry about the other side. Remember I said some of these panels are uneven. So I'm going to line them up on one side and then I'll deal with the uneven edges on the other side when I get to the hemming. But for now it's just about joining these panels together and something i'm not sure about but i think i've decided on is i've got the two yarns that i used for these strips and i wasn't sure should i use the dark one for the mattress stitch should i use the light one well the idea for the mattress stitch is that it doesn't show all that much but it will show a little bit in places because we're looping around some of these warp threads and we're looping from panel to panel and the panels are different. So I think what I will try is I will start with um, a dark color and then when I join the next panel underneath here, so that'll be a light panel again, then I will switch to the light yarn and I'll just alternate between them and we'll see how that goes. And if I really hate it, then I can always take it out. It's no big deal. So I'm going to start with a fair length of yarn. I'm sure you all know exactly what measurement I mean by fair length. It's very descriptive, right? No, let's have a better look. So let's see. It's about a meter and a half. It's a fairly long piece of yarn. And um, I probably won't need that length, but that's what I'm going to start with. And I'm just going to start at one end. Now I've just realized that I want to work from right to left. So I'm going to switch these panels around. Uh, because I'm right handed so it's 
it's more natural for me to work from the right side over to the left. And then I'm going to start with a lock stitch on one side in order to anchor the yarn. And I will have gone over this in the mattress stitch tutorial as well. So feel free to go and watch that and um, I will link to it down below or I'll link to it in a card or it'll be somewhere, somewhere that you can find it. You can count on me sometimes. <laughs> Not all the time, okay, but I try. Um, so that's my lock stitch which just basically means that that tail's not going to come shooting out of there when I put a little bit of tension on the yarn. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to be ready a lot. I'm going to be using this edge warp thread right here, which is the light colored thread. All of the dark colored thread going across, they're all weft threads, but it's the warp threads that I use for the mattress stitch. All right, so I started on that side and then you can either go over the next warp thread and through that way or you can go under and I'm going to choose to go under. And so that means that I will be taking the thread under for the entirety of the thing. It's another very precise term, entirety of the thing. All right, and then I'll go across to the next warp. And as far as like how, how far apart these stitches should be, it is a personal choice, but I prefer to make them a little bit closer rather than a little bit further. Because the closer you are, then the stronger these seams are going to be. Your blanket's going to have more integrity. The thing with a blanket is, especially if it's a wool blanket and it's fairly sizable. Um, so because it's wool and it's a heavy wool, these panels, well, they're not, they're not terribly heavy. But once you, you know, take them as a whole, put them all together, they are a bit heavy. And every time you pick the blanket up, you're going to be putting a little bit of stress on these seams. All that to say, very lengthy explanation, sorry about that, but it's just to say if your stitches are smaller, it seems are stronger. That's all. <laughs> all right, and then I'll keep going. So on the lighter panel, my edge warp thread is the same color as this dark blue thread. And then on my dark panel, my dark blue panel, the edge warp thread is the lighter color. So whichever yarn I use to do the mattress stitch, it's going to be okay either way. But as I said, I'll swap between them and see how that works out. So I'm just going under each warp thread. And yes, I made this crazy long. So I'll, I'll make the tail a little bit longer there and that will take up some of the yarn. So um, I'm almost doing a mattress stitch in between every single weft. Um, I'm not guaranteeing that I'll do that all the way along, but that's working pretty well at the moment. As far as how big my stitches are. Yeah, I think that's going to work pretty well. There are places where my weft picks are closer together and other places where they're further apart. I can see, for example, you know, down here, there's a few gaps where my weft wasn't beat in as hard, whatever it is. And so um, my wefts won't be the exact same amount apart and that's fine. You can just use your judgment as you go along. Um, as I said, you're just aiming for that strong seam. So this is going to take me a little while. That's okay. 
This is all part of the process and this can be a very nice activity to do in the evenings when you're just relaxing. You can have a couple of panels and just do them on your lap while you're doing something else, maybe listening to an audio book, maybe watching something, maybe having a conversation. It's just that mindless, gentle, quiet kind of activity. Okay, so I did say that I wasn't going to show all of this. So perhaps if you just leave me to it and I'll come and check back in with you when I've got a few panels joined and you can see how it's looking. Just in case you're wondering, because I think someone will probably ask this, can you do multiple stitches in a row and then pull the thread through? Um, so to give you an example of what I mean, I would come over here, I'd take the needle through, and then before I pulled the thread all the way through, I'd be coming over here to do the next stitch and pulling that through and then pulling. Now, I'm purposefully not doing that. I'm doing it now because I just showed you how to do it, but um, I'm not doing that, especially since my thread is still so long at the moment because it really has a propensity to tangle and also um, doing one stitch, placing one stitch at a time, I feel gives me better control and a better look at how I'm tensioning the yarn to make sure that I have a nice flat and, um, what's the word, consistent seam because if you tension it up too much, you're gonna get puckering at the seam, like that's going to kind of pucker up because it'll be too tight. And then by the same token, if you don't have your stitches tensioned enough, then you're gonna have like a zigzag kind of running between the two panels with gaps which that would be okay if that was what you were going for. But again, it wouldn't be as strong a seam and it would probably pull on those edge warp threads a little bit and wouldn't age as well either. So the tension is important and that's why I'm doing one stitch at a time. And yes, it takes longer, but hey, I don't mind because you know, you're weaving, you're woven projects. Most of them are not fast, projects and so if it takes a little bit of extra time at the end to finish it off I'm cool with that if it gives me the best results. Well, happy day friends. This blanket is very near to completion and it only took me a hundred years to sew all these panels together. <laughs> Not really, but you know, it felt like it at times. But I'm really pleased with the effect. I think it looks really great and I like the way it turned out with changing the yarns in between the rows as well. It all looks really good. The only thing I have to do now is, well, I've got to make a couple of decisions. I definitely have to cut excess fabric off this edge to make it all square. But after that, I have to decide what am I actually going to do with these edges. So on this side, all the edges are surged. So I've got two choices and I've been thinking about it and I'm not really sure what to do yet. 
uh, because they're both appealing decisions in their own way. So once I've squared this up and got all of these edges surged again, I have to decide whether I'm going to do a simple hem. So that would be just folding over an edge and sewing it down. Or am I going to do something a little bit more fancy? I had an idea yesterday, it just came to me all of a sudden that I could do a crochet border around the whole thing. And how cool would that look? And I even had like a very specific border in mind, like a double crochet border, because it, it adds a little bit of length to the outside, but it's also a little bit weighty. So good for edging and just, um, I just think it looks really nice. One problem with that. My yarn supplies, this is what I've got left of all of the yarn that it took for this blanket. Now, if I was gonna do a double crochet border, I would do a slip stitch around the entire thing with the darker yarn. And then I would do the double crochet border with this yarn. I don't think that I have enough yarn here to do a double crochet border. I think I could get away with the slip stitch with this, but I don't think I have enough to do a double border with this. So I still really like the idea of doing a crochet edging, but I want it to be kind of quite simple. Nothing frilly or fancy looking for this kind of blanket because this is kind of clean lines, straightforward kind of thing. And I don't think it would look quite it did look a bit out of place. So it would have to be a simple crochet border. And then of course, there is the consideration that a crochet border is gonna take extra time. So I'm very close to finishing this blanket. And if I just decided to do simple hems down either side, then it's done, it's finished. But I always feel like it's worth spending extra time if you get a result that you are happier with. Well, I'm going to level this out. I'm going to surge it and hopefully the answer will come to me sometime in between now and then. Some of you might be slightly horrified with what I'm doing right now, but I'm not afraid of cutting my fabric. It doesn't worry me at all. I know I can handle it. It's not a problem. There are much scarier things than cutting handwoven fabric. <laughs> all right, so I'm still gonna need to even it up, but a little at a time is better, I think. And I'm leaving a little extra length because I am going to surge that. So I'm just going to turn it around so I can better see what I'm up to. And I just need to take a little more off there. All right. Well, that's okay. I didn't have to take off too much. So I'm going to go to the surgeon now, get this all sorted out and then make some decisions. Well, it looks like I decided to do a crochet border, doesn't it? I think it's going to work out well. I'm doing, I think I'm doing a single crochet border, but I do get mixed up between the US and UK terms. So um, just in case, I will show you exactly what I'm doing. If you're not a crocheter, this is a really easy border to do. Um, I think that you could do it even if you're not familiar with crochet. 
because there's no counting or anything. It's just going in between the stitches and pulling up loops, basically, and going through other loops. <laughs> That's it. That's, it's pretty simple. This is how it looks so far. I think it's nice. It, it's good because it does have a bit of weight to it. It protects my edges. So I'm actually going, I started on a serge side because I really wanted to see would this crochet edging give enough coverage to the edges and I think that it will. And, and I like the way it looks too. It's simple, but it's a little bit decorative. So it's nice. It suits this blanket. And I'm gonna try and get around the whole blanket with this yarn, wish me luck. It looks like a lot of yarn, but remember this is an iron weight yarn. It's really thick, so it goes down pretty fast. I hope I can get around the edge of the blanket. If not, um, hmm, what will I do? I'll probably order another ball so I can finish it, but it'd be a bit of a pain because I have to order it online. I can't just go and pick it up. All right, so what I'm doing, if you're interested, is I am going into each, in between each weft, weft row, um, so there's a space, and you can see it pretty clearly in weaving. It's, it's very simple to crochet on weaving. So I'm going through the next space, right through the work, and then I've got one stitch on my hook from my last stitch, and then I'm yarn over, pull that through, and then I yarn over again, pull it through the first loop, and then yarn over again, pull that through the second loop. Come on, you can go. There we go. Is that a single crochet stitch where you're from? Let me know because I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Sometimes I just do things and hope for the best. And if I like the way it looks, then good. All right, so it, it's simple, but I am a slow crocheter. So I will probably see you in about another hundred years. We could call this the ancient blanket, couldn't we? Just because of the extra stuff that I've done with it, the hand stitching, the crochet edging. But you know, I, I love to give people options and I love for people to see like what's possible to make the weaving even better, um, to give more functionality, to be able to complete it without having all the extra equipment, maybe the sewing equipment and all that kind of stuff that um, a lot of people might not have. So anytime I come to where I've joined the two panels, I'm just going to make the best of it. And it's not going to be exactly the same at those parts, but I think it'll look okay overall. All right, friends, I will continue to crochet just as well I enjoy crocheting, hey. And I'll come back. Hey, when I come back, I'll be completely finished, won't I? Yeah, and I'll be able to show you the blanket and my happy face in finishing it. All right, so I will see you then. <laughs>